When I was a kid, it took me a while to get into Avatar. Along comes a show full of wonderment, excitement, and adventure, laced with interesting characters full of personality, and I didn't care. It was too complicated. It also didn't help that watching a story-driven show on television was hard to follow if you weren't watching each episode as it aired, since reruns tended to scatter the episodes around randomly, making it hard to keep up. I tried watching some of the bigger episodes, like The Library, The Drill, and The Day of Black Sun, but without the prior build-up, the high highs just didn't hit the same, and I quickly lost interest. Fast forward a few years to a bored kid sitting in his dorm room trying to consume anything that would provide entertainment. Sure, Red vs. Blue was funny, and the unseen rewatch of Static Shock was nostalgic, but I needed something new, and was given another opportunity to watch Avatar. So at that moment I decided that I was not throwing away my shot. What a fool I was. Avatar was an absolute gem, and I had just thrown it by the wayside. The long-form storyline that expanded over multiple seasons ending in a satisfying conclusion. The world full of unique landscapes and culture seeped into each scene effortlessly, making you feel as though you're a part of their universe. And the characters. It's hard to write characters as captivating and chemistry so magnetic as the ones displayed in Avatar. Here was a show that knew exactly what it was doing from start to finish, and was created with oodles of passion that really showed through. After watching our heroes go through their journey, it was firmly cemented as one of my favorite shows of all time. This was going to be something that was hard to beat. So, when I saw the teaser for the live-action Avatar series a few years ago, I did what any sane man would do. Cry in the fetal position, begging for the pain to end. Ah! No, but really, my hopes weren't that high. Plenty of animated shows and movies had been brought to live-action before, and many, many to a disappointing end, so things were already off to a bad start. And I'm not even going to talk about the previous iteration of the same series. We'll just leave that with a yikes. But then, a miracle happened. One Piece had received a live-action adaptation, and it wasn't bad. I dare say it was actually pretty good. Costuming was great, casting was fresh, and the story sailed off to an excellent start. Finally, something in the live-action field that wasn't a complete joke. And to top it all off, it was made for Netflix, the same company that was tagged to be housing the upcoming Avatar series as well. Things were finally turning around and starting to look a little brighter. So, how'd it turn out? <laughs> we did it, boys. Time to pack it in and call it a day. No, but really, they did a great job. Avatar the Live Action, or Atla for short, wait, covers all of book one, broken up over eight episodes. For starters, I was shocked that Netflix actually released all eight episodes in one go, since for most of their shows, they tend to break things up over a few weeks, so that was a plus. The story in this iteration is pretty similar to the original run, but they rearranged a handful of the plot points and combined them into other episodes. For example, instead of waiting for the storm to explain why Aang was in the iceberg, they just immediately started the story in the Air Nation, explaining the events leading directly into the normal starting point in the South Pole. In my opinion, if you're going to do a remake of something that was done previously, it's smart not to just copy and paste what was done before into a newer setting because even if you do an exact one-to-one -one replica of that previous version, you'll never be able to perfectly capture that feeling that somebody got the first time a series was visited. The writer seemed to understand this, and after the first episode's completion, the story starts deviating quite a bit in its execution. Katara starts using the waterbending scroll way earlier on Kyoshi Island. Jet and the Mechanist show up in Omashu instead of their normal spawn points. The Great Divide is... The pacing and delivery of information has changed a lot compared to the original. It's not my favorite, but I completely understand the one to encapsulate similar story beats in one location, instead of breaking it up into all different locations that they were originally. Some of the original episodes in Book 1 did tend to drag on. As someone who's seen the show before, you might not like all of the decisions made and episodes cut, but if you're one that's never seen Avatar before, you'll still get a full understanding of the story and won't be left with that feeling that you've missed out on something, and for that, the show succeeds. Now, I'd like to talk a bit about the characters, because this part was probably my least favorite part of the experience, which is a shame, because comparatively, this was the best part of the original run. Tara and Sokka were both well-casted, and had a decent presentation of their characters. Sokka takes a little while to get going, but becomes one of the best in the party as the show moves on. And for Katara, she did well, but for some reason, every time I saw her on screen, I kept getting Carmen vibes from Spy Kids. I don't know, don't ask. But for Aang? Well, the kid's got some troubles. In most scenes, Gordon does a great job and gives off the energy you want from Aang, but in others, the line delivery just feels wrong, and he puts too much emphasis in the diction, and it really can take you out of a scene. If he was just a side character, this wouldn't be too big of a deal, but he's the main character, so it's kind of hard to ignore slip-ups like this. Luckily, though, the show shines brightly with some good performances from Zuko and Iroh. They are both great from start to finish, and I'm excited to see how they'll deliver on their more intense scenes in the future. And by god, they did some fantastic casting for Ozai. Like, dang! This guy feels like he was ripped directly out of the animated series and thrown onto screen. The only other person we have left is Azula, who is a little off with her performance. I mean, I wasn't even expecting to see her in this season yet. They gave her a handful of short scenes to develop her character, but something just felt wrong about how her conniving and perfectionism came across. I'm mostly just going to chalk it up as something that can't translate that well from the animated medium, 
Over there, you can have the kid be smart or insane, and it'll really hit home. But you do that with an actual kid in the same way, and it just comes across as cheesy or fake, which is unfortunate because she was one of my favorites in the original run. The biggest character, though, that got screwed was my boy Appa. Like, what happened? He went from being this friendly, six-legged blob of joy to being a simple mount used to get from one location to the next. Not an ounce of personality was given to him, and I'm going to have a hard time missing him in the next season if you don't make me care about him now. The first season takes us from the South to North Pole and everywhere in between and does so beautifully. Every location you see does a great job replicating and sometimes even improving on the looks of the original run. The cities visited look vast and full of life and really bring you into the experience as well. The costume department also deserves a pat on the back because all of the main and background characters look exactly the way you would expect them to, with many one-to-one -one translations from the cartoon popping right out into the real world. Sometimes, however, it can look a bit too pristine and is lacking a bit of the wear and tear and now if it would actually get after use. But enough on that, let's get to the best part of the entire show. The action in this rendition is fantastic. The bending felt weighty and the characters did a good job emulating the martial arts needed to bend their elements, unlike a certain movie that we still won't be mentioning. The CGI for the bending also felt great, barring a couple wonky scenes. Air bending was blowing, water bending was splashing, and fire bending was burning. No, really, there was a lot of burning, like, dang, I wasn't expecting so many people to actually be incinerated in the show. They also did a good job making the non-benders feel less useless. I mean, Sokka makes a big deal about it in the original run, and he's right, he barely does anything in that. This time around, not so much. There were a couple fights from the original run that weren't in this rendition, but the fights that were in the show were fantastic. Kyoshi Island was much more exciting and included some new and unique parts to it, while the scene with the Blue Spirit gave that same sleek prison escape vibe. The biggest improvement, however, was certainly the Siege of the North. Some of the earlier CGI may have been lacking, but not here. They certainly went all out for the finale and showed off quite a spectacle in the process. So in the end, I'd say, yeah, this is great. Not as good as the original show in some parts, but also a lot better in others. I'm hoping that some of the acting levels up between seasons after they get some time to breathe, but overall, I'm glad this was made, and I'm looking forward to how they continue to adapt the story in Season 2. And with that, I'm out. We'll see you next time.